What's up, friends? Welcome back to Rooted Wisconsin, where we are dedicated to authentically sharing the stories of the people who drive Wisconsin culture. Thanks for coming with us again. We'll start off our episode the same way we do everyone by thanking you. Thank you for your likes, shares, subscribes. Thanks for watching. Thank you for interacting with us on social media. Uh, Click and like and share out there. And however you engage with the show, we appreciate you being out there. We make the content for you and uh, appreciate you uh, coming back again and again. So thanks for doing that. Uh, Big shout out to Ryan and his whole team at Riverside Pizzeria of Green Bay or specifically Ashwaubenon. Stop in in Riverside and get the best pizza in Wisconsin. And uh, I like the number six. You can go with one yours, but uh, pepperoncinis are close to my heart. So stop in and uh, uh, get a Riverside every time you're in Green Bay. And uh, also the great folks at Wonder Sign for some awesome uh, rooted Wisconsin materials that we can uh, get you out. Shoot us a message if you're uh, looking for something like that. And uh, lastly, our friends at Discover Green Bay for some awesome studio space. So with that being said, let's get our next episode started. Our guest today, thanks for coming in, Adam Krause. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you in, man. Yeah, absolutely. We've had uh, we've had the chance to talk quite a bit. Adam yeah. was my neighbor for uh, several years. Yep. So I always thought your project was interesting, man. I, we went quite a while of like those classic like neighbor engagements or interactions before like we got to the gags thing or like <laughs> what your career even was. Yep. And uh, I I don't know. I, I've always wanted to talk further about it since then. So I'm sure. glad we carved out some time. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, before we jump into all that, uh, I just know from getting to know you that movies are a central piece of your life. Um, yeah. It seems like for a long time, like, where does that passion start? I don't know. It, it is. It has been my entire life. I was that kid in first grade who was writing letters to Steven Spielberg. You know, like, I want to be a film director one day. How do I do it? Uh I, I don't know. I, I've always, my family has always really been into films. You know, my, some of my best childhood memories are watching Ghostbusters with my dad on the couch. Um, and it was just, it was just always something I loved. I loved the escapism of it. Um, I loved getting lost in a story and characters and, uh, yeah, it's just always stayed with me. Um, uh, that, that desire to want to make films. And then in high school, you know, I would take the AV courses and we would make short films in high school. Um, and it was just one of those things where I'm like, you know, because as a junior in high school, I wasn't that type of kid I'm from a small town. I remember actually being kind of frustrated in like junior year when like the shift went towards college and everyone's like, let's start talking about college and where do you want to go and applying for scholarships. And uh, I don't know, I guess I was kind of a slacker because I was like, nah, I'm having too much fun. I don't want to think about that. But there became a time where I'm like, I I have to do something. Um, And I just, I'm like, well, I'll go for film. Um, Knowing I didn't want to go too far from home, because I've always kind of been a homebody. At least I was back then, um, you know, when I was a teenager. And uh, And now you travel a lot. Yeah, I do. And now I actually appreciate, you know, I mean, you know, hindsight's 2020. You know, now as a 40-year-old, do I wish I would have, like, tried to go to film school somewhere else out of state yeah i think i probably do but at the time i just applied to one school university of wisconsin oshkosh because they had a film program and i went and toured it and i thought it was super cool and i heard good things it was either that or uw milwaukee those were like the two two schools that had like the good film programs in wisconsin um but oshkosh was closer to home it was the only school i applied to i got accepted went to school for film um yeah. And then, I mean, after I graduated college, you know, I tried to, I moved on to Chicago and I worked for a production company. Um, I was an intern and I started working for them, but, uh, it was 2008, 2009 and the economy wasn't that great. Um, so ultimately my work started like disappearing there. So I moved back to green Bay, uh, and just took like a normal non-film job. Uh, but I told myself I would just keep making short films. I mean, it's, to me, it was like fishing, you know, like it's a, it's a hobby of mine. So I'm going to spend the money. I'm going to do what I have to do to make sure I can keep doing it. Um, And that's, that's kind of where we were at. So once I moved back, I, I I just started making short films and the short, the gag short was the third short film I made after moving home from Chicago, um, which was in 2016. I think that's something we forget about a lot, especially with like the past you know, what, five to six years, I would say of like, 
labor shortage, like everybody's looking for people. When we graduated college, like we're very close to the same age. When, when that happened, like jobs were impossible to get. It was awful. Yeah. It was, it was, I have, when I realized like this, the film company that I was working for in Chicago, when I realized like full time with benefits, wasn't going to happen. Yeah. I entered like months of just applying to anything I could find. And it's Chicago. I mean, it's third biggest city in the country. You know, it should be like an employment hub, but uh, I couldn't get anything. Mm-hmm. It was very, very discouraging. Um, and I'm not even exaggerating. Months of just applying to everything. And pretty soon it got to the point where like, I, I just took my skills that I feel like I acquired in college. I just took those off the table. And I'm like, I'll do anything. Yep. <laughs> you know? like, I ended up getting a job as a data entry a uh, data entry for a, a website down downtown Chicago. Um, but it was only part-time, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, it was, it was very rough when we graduated college. Like it wasn't, it wasn't easy. And that all ultimately factored into me moving home to green Bay. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's, it was cheaper, cheaper to live in green Bay. And uh, I could use my, my family's connections to yep. get a job, which I ultimately did. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, re- I remember that. Like, um, like I sold office supplies for a little bit. Sure. Like I was trying to have a career in radio at that time mm-hmm. and like same story. I think I emailed every radio station in Wisconsin and I was like, you guys need anybody? Yep. And finally one dude emailed back and I got a job on Saturday and Sunday morning uh, running the, the board for like cool. you know, six hours. Like, yeah, that yeah. was the the first thing. But yeah, that was such a different environment than now where everybody's like scratching and clawing for people to like please come work for me. Yep. Not so much like that then. So it was a different ball game. Yeah, I remember it, this is funny in Chicago, uh, I can't remember uh the name of the but the Jerry Springer show was filmed in Chicago. And um they were looking for entry level, you know, I think it was just production assistant, you know, but, uh, I was, I, I had a, I had a ca- circle with other, um, like interns in the Chicago area. Cause we would do shoots and we would PA on shoots and we'd make good money, but we all kind of became friends. Well, it turns out we were all fighting for the same Jerry Springer job, which was a production assistant. <laughs> and, uh, it's just funny to look back on cause it was such kind of like a, you know, the show is what it is, but, uh, at the time we were like, yeah, we want to work for Jerry Springer, you know, cause that was going to be our in, yep. in Chicago entertainment. And, um, I just knew that everyone in my circle had applied for it. I don't think any of us got it. I think yeah, I, we don't know who got the job, but that's just about how like desperate I guess we were, where it's like getting to be a production assistant on Jerry Springer was like, Oh my God, this the is me- my end. Yeah. <laughs> this is my end. <laughs> yeah. I often think about, uh, you said that Oshkosh and UWM were the two in the, in the mm-hmm. state. I, I used to work at a grocery store while I was in college and I was in Milwaukee. And I often think of, there was a dude who was going through the film program that worked at the grocery store with me. Okay. And I think about him a lot. I can't even remember his last name, but his first name was Dan. And I wonder like where he ended up. Cause similar story, like his passion was in film. Like mm-hmm. that's what he wanted to do. He was putting all his eggs in that basket and that was his goal. And it was that environment out there. And we just kind of like, I left the grocery store and we drifted paths and he wasn't like a social media guy or anything. Sure. So it's just one of those weird life things where like, I've thought about him a time or two, like wondering where he is. You yeah. Know? I, I'm lucky. In maybe that. he got the Jerry Springer job. Yeah, you know? maybe he did. <laughs> 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 no, uh, I'm lucky enough for like, uh, the, uh, all of my contacts and friends, like I'm still in touch. Thanks to social media. Um, with a lot of the people I went to school with, uh, went, went to college with. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of them did go out to LA. Like I was that terrified me, um, that thought. And again, it's one of those things where as I got older, maybe I wish I, I had, you know, a little more courage to do something like that. But, uh, a lot of them did, they went out to LA and did whatever they had to do. And there's, some of them are still out there now. Some of them are doing very well for themselves. You know, I went to college with, um, uh, person who ended up being the lead writer for Netflix's daredevil show, you know? Um, and he was, and he was, he was like the UW Oshkosh's like star pupil. Like he was, he was good. He was, he was a great director. He was a great writer and he was just a cool dude, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just like one of those things where you couldn't even be mad. You're just happy for him. You're just happy for like the success he got. But yeah, I know a lot of people are still out there. Um, I know a lot of people who have kind of moved all over the place and then, um, 
you know, uh, the cinematographer that um, I use for the Gags short film and who ultimately was a cinematographer for our feature film when we got the funding for the feature, uh, DJ Cast, uh, we went to, we graduated on the same day from UW Oshkosh from the film program. And like we have, I consider him one of my good friends to this day. And uh, hopefully we got another project that we're going to be working on here uh, just after the new year. But um, yeah, you know, relationships that you've, that have stayed with you. And I wouldn't trade, you know, you can say what it is about, you know, my dad, people, the critics will be like, oh, you should have went for finance or you should have went for business, like something. And I get that argument. Trust me, as a father now in my 40s, I totally get that <laughs> argument. But at the same time, I wouldn't trade my college experience for anything. Like, yeah. It was it was a lot of fun. Well, <laughs> and, and still, I mean, you still have the foundation of your passion. And I mean, you got a good gig that yeah. you're doing good. Yeah, you're no, well. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, yeah. And I, I actually, I surprisingly, and I know I've, we've talked about this, but I ended up using like my film skills, uh, you know, video production and stuff. I use that a lot at my job. You know, it's one of those things where you kind of carve your niche out and then they, all of a sudden they find out like, wait a minute, you can do this. Cause this would really help if you could, you know, go to this place and film this. And if you could, if you could edit it together and, you know, mix the sound and do all that on your own, and that's going to save us from like contracting it out, that would be great. And I ended up getting, I ended up working for the company I work for now, their marketing department, just because they found out I made films Mm -hmm. and they were like, here, let's, they bought me a camera and they got the gear I needed. And I was just a one man crew going out to a, you know, it's industrial like service centers, but still, you know, it's, it's, I was able to use what I learned in college in the real world, you know? So, Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and as the more video gets prominent, I mean, video is everywhere now. Pretty much every mm-hmm. social media algorithm demands video. Yep. The more that happens, the more that skill set is needed. Yep. And it's, it's not something you learn overnight. I mean, I've been humbled since we started the podcast trying to learn video. I'd always worked with audio and like, you know, it's something that takes a lot of time and effort. So it, it's not a skill that's just, uh, you know, no. falls by the wayside. You know? Yeah. And it is, I mean, I'm dating myself here, but um, when I was in college, you know, the, the iPhone wasn't a thing. You know? yeah. and, and now it's funny, like the, the resolute, what you can get with the phone that's just in our pockets. I mean, we would have done anything for like, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were shooting on these bulky like digital recorders in college. And if you were lucky, you know, if you were a junior or senior, you got to use, you got to shoot on 16 millimeter film and use one of the bowl axes. But, um, <laughs> was, I think about that all the time. I'm like, man, if I had just an iPhone, especially like the now where like the settings just, they all, they have the cinematic setting right there where like it, it, it creates this beautiful picture, you know, with, you know, a, a shallow depth of field if you're on a close up, and it's just all these things that that iPhone does. I'm like, oh my <laughs> like if I was, if this existed when I was in college, man, I could have, I could have made something really great, you know, at least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, gags, look, make sure you talk into the mic too. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about gags. So that wasn't even your first short. What was your first short? Like of all or, time? Yeah. Or, well, or, you said, you said there were like three after college, right? Gigs was like the third one. Yeah. So, okay. So out of college, the first one I did was, uh, as a zombie film. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It, so the basic, it was an outbreak, an outbreak at Meadowbrook Park, it was called. So we shot it at Meadowbrook Park in Howard. And the basic premises was, and I had just bought in a Canon 7D. You know, it, that was all the rage is you, you got those new Canon DSLRs, but they shot beautiful high def um, video footage Mm -hmm. and but they would shoot it with the 24 frames per second or 23.97 which mimicked film the best it mimicked the 24 frames per second and i remember like i asked my parents for it for my birthday and they got it for me and i was like all right i gotta shoot a project with this immediately so um i knew at the time i was working as an editor for an article marketing company in De Pere. Um, which uh, I, I could say what I want about the job, but I did meet a lot of great people there. Um, it's kind of similar to what we were just talking about, like a bunch of a bunch of like uh, communications majors and and uh, film majors and journalism majors who couldn't find a job, and we all just kind of congregated at this one like business where we were we were our title was editor, but we were going through like article marketing 
trash, you know, just people trying to optimize their search engine Mm -hmm. uh, results. Um, But anyway, I knew two people who worked at that company and they were getting married and they had great senses of humor. So I'm like, could I do your wedding, your engagement photos, but we turn it into a short film, um, a zombie film. And they're like, they were like, (laughs) we're all ears. Hear me. So I'm like, okay, so it's essentially, it's like a, a documentary of like, I'm the, the POV is me. I'm the wedding or the, the photographer. And we're taking pictures of the couple at Meadowbrook Park as a zombie outbreak is happening. Um, so certain, you know, as they're taking pictures, we're hearing screams like through the park. Um, and they come across like someone who's like dazed and you know they're just like transforming into a zombie. And uh, it just turns, it's an 11 minute short that, Again, I shot with little to no money and just had, uh, you know, five or six friends show up to help me. And uh, it really turned out to be a really fun short film. And like in, in 11 minutes, it goes from this sweet picture of this couple getting their engagement photos to just all out chaos. And they're being chased by zombies through Meadowbrook Park. And it was fun. It was a lot, a lot of fun. And uh, I finished it. I it ended up winning, uh, I think, best horror film at the... Uh, wildwood film festival in appleton I, I don't think they do it anymore but for a while they would do that every year and it was it was a great festival it just focused on wisconsin made content oh cool um and then i think it expanded to include like productions that at least had a, a wisconsin native in a prominent production role um but yeah it won best best short at that festival and it's still i mean you i can watch it now and i can like nitpick a lot of the aesthetics um but we just had a lot of fun and it was really really cool um that's in any creative realm man yeah oh yeah for sure the most critical eye is always the self-facing eye you know yep yeah and again with what we did it for it was it it was a fun project um and then i did uh just a straight up horror um uh, called home sweet home um, and that was at the time it was my biggest project to date and, um, uh, shot it at a friend, a friend had just bought a house, um, way up North and he, his plan was to renovate it cause it was in pretty rough shape, but I remember visiting him and seeing it it was in rough shape, but it was in like great rough shape where I'm like, God, this would be perfect for a horror film. And luckily he's like, yeah, you know, if you want to shoot a horror film here, let me know. And he, he let me get in there and uh, I wrote a script, you know, and ended up being a 30 minute short, which in hindsight, it's, it's too long for a short. So anyone out there, like don't make a short film that, that long because <laughs> uh, festivals, it has to be really good for a festival to accept it. Cause that's just too, too much of a commitment for their time blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, but I made it. Uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, my, my friend DJ who I referred to earlier, he shot it. Um, he owns his own video production company. So he like was awesome. Like, he had all this great equipment for us to use. Um, just brought his van there, you know, and we could just take anything that we wanted and use it. And uh, that was really cool. That was fun. And then after that was gigs. And that was the one that kind of changed, you know, that was the one that really blew up. And uh, yeah, yeah. That, that was one thing I was going to ask today. I, I can't really remember. Um, what was, what was virality at that point? Like, was it, was the, term thrown around like it is now it was oh yeah absolutely yeah um and it was a decision too where there was a long time like when we went viral and then we made the announcement that you know it's not a real person it's not a real clown this is for a short film and everyone was like you got to capitalize on this like you have you know you have fifty five thousand followers on facebook you have to make uh you have to make a, a feature and i even when the actual producers who ended up producing the feature came to me, I was very hesitant because I knew how long it takes to make a feature, especially on a budget that we were working with. Like it was a very small scale. I know the passion that would need to be required to do that. And in my head, I'm like, this is a fad. This is like all things viral. This is going to go just as quickly as it came, you know? Uh, and you and were worried about it kind of like running out before you finished. Right. Like, and, and, and I think to an extent that did happen with our feature. It, it, it had so much momentum. Uh, but this was the end of 2016, you know, and it, the momentum was great. And Alice Cooper was sharing our posts and Bam Margera was sharing our posts and it was great. But I mean, by the time we got the script written for the feature 
and uh, um, and then we shot the actual feature film, which was April two thousand seventeen. It, you could tell that just the interest we, we still had a lot of people paying attention, but a lot of the, you know, national interest on that surface level of just like, Oh, I wonder what's going on with that. A lot of that had died down because mm-hmm. it, it went viral. The next know? news cycle or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And you still see it today. I mean, the things that are viral, you know, uh, that, that hawk to a girl yeah. a, a few months ago, like you couldn't turn on your computer without hearing about her. And now it's like, uh, yeah, She's faded into oblivion. Mm -hmm. At least I think she has. I I don't. I don't pay attention. Strangely enough, she's doing like the comedian podcast circuit. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I've seen. What do I know? I haven't (laughs) watched any of them, but I've seen her on like three different comedians' podcasts. But I just don't know how after that's done, how she's going to transition it to. Unless she starts a podcast. Like, and, and, and maybe, maybe she's born it. for it. You know, maybe she's just great at that. And, and it's just one of those things where she makes a career out of it. I mean, and good on her too. And I know that's, I think a friend was telling me that that's why she stayed in obscurity for those days or weeks after it went viral. Because she was like lining up her, like Claim, she got an yeah. agent and she got a manager. And she's just like, how do I capitalize on this? This mm-hmm. I didn't do anything like that with gigs. <laughs> I was just watching from my computer at home dumbfounded. Uh, so what was the timing of when it went viral? Sure. Uh, so we, so the short film, uh, I shot it in April of 2016. And it was just, uh, just this cool short, like, and I thought of it based on real stories of this happening before, you know, it's clown roaming. It was a clown roaming phenomenon. There was a, there was a clown out in Wasco, California, uh, which ended up being a photo project for college, but it was, it was a guy walking around in a creepy clown costume and uh, someone had snapped pictures of him and it went viral. And this, and then the same thing happened out in England, Berkshire, the Berkshire clown happened in Berkshire, England, I'm assuming. And uh, it was just this clown, it just this creepy clown walking around a city in the middle of the day and just baiting people to take pictures of him. And I'm just like, God, that would make a great idea for a movie. And, and, and then I was just like thinking about thinking about it. I'm like, okay, knowing like I, I came up with this idea to make this short film and it would be a found footage film, which I think like goes really well with the clown roaming phenomenon because these clowns bait people to take out their phones and, and film them. And I'm like, Oh yeah, you could do a found footage film. And then of course, you know, found footage is, I mean, I don't buy into that thought that it's, it's a cop out and it's so much easier than traditional narrative style filmmaking. Um, Cause a lot, it is hard. Um, it's hard to do right. It's hard to do authentically, but yeah, it does allow you certain, uh, you can get by with, you know, certain things that you can't with traditional uh, narrative filmmaking. Uh, you, you just have a little bit more leniency. Um, but, um, so yeah, and I, I wrote this script and I even remember, I kept it very, very, cause I, I told my cast and my crew at the time, I'm like, let's keep this. Just don't tell anybody about this because anything, if it works out the way I want it to, we're going to convince the city of green Bay that they have an actual clown roaming the city, the city streets. And, and it was a very small cast and they were all totally on board and they were, they were awesome. I'm still in touch with all of them to this day. Like local people for the Yeah, all part? local okay. people. Yeah, all local people. Um and um uh so we so I shot it. We did uh no, I'm sorry. We did the costume test. We had the 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 costume made up. We did his first test in April. And that's honestly the pictures that I was posting after we went viral. Uh 99% of them were shot in April, like 5 months before it even went viral. Um but we did the costume test and I'm like, "Oh, and this turned out great. You know, we had a, we had a company down in Austin, Texas, make the suit for us. And they specialize in haunt, like making attire for like people who do haunts. So they made this dingy, gross clown suit for us. And, um, I had, uh, I had, uh, enlisted artists to make a mask for me. Um, but cause I knew uh, from the start, I didn't want like face paint. Like I wanted it to be a mask. Um, but, um, none of the masks that they made like turned out, I didn't like them. So I made my own. Um, and I, like I watched a YouTube video about how to make this burlap mask with plaster and, and latex and, um, made this mask. And then I painted this clown face on it. And, um, that just turned out really great, like really great. Um, 
And of course, my actor, uh, Eric Hubelman, who played Giggs the Clown, he was the only one who's ever played Giggs. Um, he was great to work with because he was so excited about the project. He lived in Appleton, but he would drive to Green Bay whenever. And he's got four kids. He had four kids. But he would he would work it out, and he would drive to Green Bay whenever I needed him. He was he was fantastic, and we're really good friends to this day. Um, but um, yeah, we took the pictures in April. Every, I'm like, this looks great. We shot the short in May of 2016 for four days, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and um, and then I took the summer to edit it. And then I told him, I'm like, I'll let you know when we're ready to when we're ready to share the pictures to try and convince Green Bay that they have this roaming clown. And I told him, I'm like, look, I'm going to do this. If no one cares, then I'm just going to, you can start talking about the project. You know, it's, it's, I, I don't expect for it to work. Um, I created a dummy Facebook account to post the pictures. And then I had, I, I reached out to five friends I had in my network who I knew had, who had very large networks. And they just, they had, they were just, uh, anything they would post would get a ton of traction and a ton of comments and a ton of likes. And so I reached out to those five people and I said, here, this is what I'm doing. And can you, I'm going to share this on this dummy account. Can you share it to your page and just act like it's real and just be like, hey, this is creepy, you know? And all five of them agreed to it. And that was, that was like my kindling, you know, that was like the little I did to see if this would start, if this would go. And uh, I remember I shared it. It was August 1st at like 1230 AM. And like, cause I was, I've always been a night owl. So that's like when I would do the most of my work is at night and, or in the middle of, you know, in the AM hours. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I shared it on the dummy account knowing that those five people would share it. And I woke up and, uh, just kind of took my time. And I, that first time I checked Facebook, I'll just never forget it. Like it already had like 9,000 shares and I was just like, and I'm just like kind of dumbfounded. It actually worked. Yeah. And I'm like <laughs> staring at my computer and I'm like seeing just beyond the five people that shared it, but like the alarm that it was causing of like, Oh my God, what is wrong with this guy? And, um, and just seeing it. And then like I went to work because at the time I worked, I worked uh, nights. I worked uh, two to 10 and, um, so by the time I got to work, I check it again and we were at like 14,000 shares and I check it again at like four. And of course, like the few people that knew like my cast and crew, they're all texting me like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and it just, it blew up that first week. It was a lot of fun. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was crazy. And it was like things I never even expected to encounter when doing this. And, um, and, uh, you know, obviously there was a lot of, there was, lot of good and bad that came with it a lot of people were worried um thinking that their neighborhood isn't safe anymore you know and uh it was it was nuts and then ultimately we had um uh i think i think it was eight days after it went viral i made the decision to go public and say that i did this it's not a real person this is for a film i made um we were, we were talking about maybe stretching it on longer but i know I know someone went to uh, the news and they got interviewed uh, who like outed us. They said, they're like, you shouldn't be scared. This is, um, this is a, f a filmmaker doing this. And he says he did it because uh, he was worried about public safety, but he was also one of the actors who went for one of the roles who didn't get the part. So there was always that, like, I wonder how long we could have actually went if, that person didn't get that WBAY news story saying like, don't worry, it's for a film. But I know that played into me finally making the decision to say like, yes, he's right. It's a film. And to this day, I, I never talked to him again. I don't hold, I mean, I have no ill feelings toward him whatsoever, but um, I just always thought that was kind of funny. Like he's like, yeah, I was worried about public safety. I'm like, yeah, but you also didn't get the lead part, you know? <laughs> so I, I felt like there was a little of that, that factored into him outing us. But, um, but yeah, it was, uh, and even after, you know, we went public, there were still a lot of people who chose not to acknowledge that, or maybe they didn't see it. So like, it just kept going on and then it spurred, all those additional clown sightings all over the country. Um, it got crazy. You know, it got, it got to the point where the press secretary for the white house had to comment on it. 
about all the <laughs> really? clown sightings. Yeah, it was it was insane. Um, how it like just snowballed, and all of a sudden there were clowns down in South Carolina who were luring children into the woods, and there was a clown in Indianapolis who who was chasing people in cars, and it just it just blew up. And I remember everyone thinking it was Rob Zombie behind it because Rob Zombie had a the movie thirty or thirty one coming out about. It was a horror movie dealing with clowns. So everyone thought Rob Zombie was doing it. And I was like, no, don't give Rob Zombie the credit. It was me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So after, like, during the viralness of it, uh, you weren't making content. All the content was done already. All the content was done already. Yeah, it was. And it was funny. A funny story because this is, you know, your old neighborhood. Um, One of the test pictures I took uh, was at Waterford Park. Okay. Just that park that, you know, we always take Clementine to. Um, and uh, just took it, you know, at night. Any park is creepy at night. We took yeah. this picture of Eric in the full costume under this light. And he just, he looked terrifying. <laughs> and after we had run, went viral, I posted it. But of course, like it was taken five months earlier, but no one knew that. And it was just one of those times where I don't think I'll ever get to experience it again, where you post something and just within seconds, you have 100 likes, 200 likes, 200 likes. Like, I'm pretty sure that's just like what Taylor Swift feels like every time she <laughs> posts something. Like me, I was just like, I was blown away. I'm like, this is insane. But the cool thing was, like I posted that picture. And all of a sudden, like, 20 comments, 50 comments, 100 comments. And I'm looking at the comments. And th- they would they would take the picture and they would they would download it to their computer and they would adjust the levels, make it brighter. And then, someone would be, then, then they would post it and be like, does anyone know where this park is? And then a bunch of comments, bunch of comments. And then someone would be like, that's Waterford Park. I know, like my grandma lives there. All right, let's go. And I was just like, no way. So it's just right down the road from us. So me and my wife got into our car and we drove, just circled Waterford Park. And sure enough, there was 12, 14 kids running around with flashlights looking for Gags the Clown. Really? It was insane. It was, and it just, it had that type of, like it was a game, you know, like find the creepy clown in, in Green Bay. And then we wanted to capitalize on that. And like start actually planning um, events where me and Eric would go and then we would drop clues as to where he was going to be so people could find us and take pictures of us, you know, and have it be a photo op um, just for fun. But then like the violent, the, the threats started coming in of and it, 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 it went directly into the feature film. Uh, we started getting a lot of death threats a lot of if i found that clown i i'd use my god-given right to shoot him you know and and then we started getting pictures where like one where the first pictures it was under the mason street bridge right downtown where we posted those original pictures someone sent to the facebook page that i had to report it to facebook they were standing in the same spot that gigs was in the pictures but they were holding an assault rifle and they were like, this, you know, I hope I see the clown holding this. This is my answer. And it just got to the point where I couldn't risk Eric's safety. Like, I'm like, I, I don't trust, you know, there's a large portion of this audience right now that I don't trust. Like, they're going to try and do something dangerous here to this clown, whether it's out of fear or to make a point or whatever. So we had to cancel those. We had to, like, Eric never made it back out after we went viral until we premiered the short film um at the uh at the time community theater in oshkosh which at the time they had a uh a horror fe- film festival and that and i i knew everyone that ran it i was good friends with them so that's where we premiered it mm-hmm. um, no i'm sorry that we played there but we premiered at the De Pierre cinema i'm sorry we we sold tickets and and premiered at the De Pierre cinema and that was the first time eric was in costume since we went viral because it just it wasn't safe enough for him. And probably more comfortable because, like, you controlled the narrative and the yeah. environment yep. in that scenario, right? Absolutely, yeah, because yeah. there was just too many variables with, like, going on. I mean, it would have been fun, as long, you know, at least to the people that were seeing it as such. Like, this is just, like, a fun gimmick, like like the haunt crowd, you know, like yeah. just going out and trying to find find this character. But there was just too much too much evidence you know, pointing towards there's also a lot of people that I think would try and hurt him, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so how'd you, how did you do it when you decided to break the news that it was you? Did you make another Facebook post? Did you? Okay. Yeah. It was all through Facebook, just my personal account. Um, uh, I just, I posted a picture that my cinematographer took of me on set with gigs. Um, 
Eric in the costume yeah. and uh, just posted it and said, look, this is, the, you know, this was me. This, this was something I did to try and market a short film I made. I, I, I should reread it. It was a very long post. I like, I made it all. Like I spent way too much time on it. You know, it was one of those <laughs> things I spent like three days writing and I think I opened it up with like, why do people find clowns scary? You know? And I gave, of course, my input on why I found find clowns scary. And yeah, I made it like this big, long post and yeah, it was, it was, and then of course it was really fun after that, like all of the comments flowing and like, we knew it was you, you know, or like we're watching this and we're like, I bet you that was Adam, you know, (laughs) it was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So did all the momentum up to it, did the short do pretty well? Um, so the short, it's funny. Like the short is a completely different film from the feature. I'm very proud of both of them. Um, the short is something I just did all by myself. Like I, I, I wrote it, I directed it, I produced it, I funded it completely myself. Um, I had DJ uh, Cass, he was a cinematographer and the sound guy. Like he was like my one man crew, like miking up all the actors and you know, uh, filming everything and helping us with everything. But it was really just kind of like, and it, it was just like a me and DJ were like the only people doing it. And it was just, it was kind of fun. And, I say guerrilla filmmaking, even though it wasn't. I had complete permission from the city of Green Bay to do everything with the short film. Like I remember having to tar- get uh, permission, and, and it took an extensive period of time to get permission to shoot in the Pine Street parking ramp. Uh, there was a key scene that took place there, and uh, I, I mean, I got permission. It, everything was done by the books. I had production insurance. I did everything. Um, but I think a lot of people got the idea just from the style of the film that it was like we were running around, no permission, just shooting things guerrilla style. That wasn't the case. But at times it felt like that because we were just such a, a small crew and just running and gunning through the streets of Green Bay. But um, the short is more like straight up horror. It's like more of a straight up horror film. Whereas uh, there's horror elements in the feature, but really that the feature was born from everything we dealt with, with the short going viral, that was the motivation behind the feature. Is like, what if we use this for the feature? You know, we had, you know, cops looking out for people who are trying to copycat them. We had, we had, we had a lot of people who were who were going to the streets and saying they were going to go clown hunting. Uh, we had kids uh, dressing up like clowns and and doing the copycatting, and we had the news reporters desperately trying to find out who we were and get anything they could on gigs, a clown, all of that ended up being the feature film. So the feature film is more social commentary on us going viral with the short, but the short film is just more, it's just, it's just a fun horror short, you know? Um, so the short did do well, but not a lot of people got to see it because from the start, and when, when I ultimately agreed to make the feature and you know, the producer's, came to me and said we should do this and I had it was my goal to make a feature film and as I was saying earlier like I was hesitant because gigs was viral but at the same time I'm like yeah let's just do this this is going to be fun you know um but from the start one of the producers said like pull the short don't let anyone see the short again you know because the short's just going to interfere with could be spoiler you know could be have spoilers for the feature Mm -hmm. pull the short and to this day like it was supposed to be one of the uh, the perks of buying the Blu-ray DVD is you can get the short, the original short film is on the Blu-ray and the DVD. And mm. then of course we always knew that, like don't put it on YouTube, you know, don't put it on Vimeo, like have it be just an, a special feature that you can only get buying the DVD and Blu-ray. I, I, I don't think it helped with sales like they thought it would, but um, that was, that was the goal or that was uh, what we said we would do from the start. Um, so Yeah, I don't know if a lot of people ultimately got to see the short because Mm -hmm. we had like the two, three festival screenings and then it was just shelved because it's like, let's do the feature. Don't ever post it. And and who knows, maybe I'll have to look at like our distribution agreement um, that we have with the feature, but maybe I'll put it on YouTube for free. and If it like sunsets someday or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I am, I'm really, really proud of the short film. Um, And it was just this labor of love Um, whereas for the feature, I had like a full crew, like a full movie crew working for me, you know, like, uh, you know, 25, 30 people. Um, 
but that short was just me and DJ and my cast just running around, you know? Yeah. And how does the feature come about then? I'm, I'm sure like in that scenario, I'm guessing it's like any other thing that happens that goes viral. There's people that understand there's money to be made there and they're mm-hmm. probably like reaching out to you, right? Is yep. that how the feature is born then? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So it was, um, I had a lot of, um, like, uh, agents, you know, and managers, like they'd reach out to me and they're like, this is after I made the announcement that I was, it was for a film. And they'd be like, oh, you know, do you have anyone representing you? Or do you have something else you can send me? Like just doing their due diligence to make sure, you know, am I the next like big horror thing? You know, the next big horror filmmaker. So they were doing their due diligence. Like, hey, do you have like a, a, a spec script you could send me? Do you have this? So there was a lot of that. But as far as, making the feature it was really just the two producers from chicago that approached me and and my they had already been connected to me in a sense because uh, a very good friend of mine john pata for nosh gosh he's also a filmmaker um and he made a short film in 2013 called pity that um that these producers also worked on so like we kind of knew each other in that circle and then when everything blew up and stuff and we were going to be at the at the film festival in Oshkosh, they drove up um, the night of the festival from Chicago. And then they, they made the pitch to me of like, mm. Hey, we want to turn this into a feature. And, um, and then I, the, co- I, I directed the feature, but I co-wrote it with John because John was ultimately the one who, cause I was still in my phase of like, I don't know if I want to make a feature like this is viral. It's going to cool off very quick. No one's going to care in a few days. But John's the one who kind of pitched me this idea. He's like, well, what if it's not? And I think at one point I said to him, like, I don't want to make another, like, slash em up horror clown movie where a clown's just running around killing people. I don't I don't want to do that. Um, and he's just like, well, what if it's not about the clown? Like, what if it's about everything you've just been dealing with these last two months of, like, uh, this clown exists, but the ruckus it's causing. You know, I think his exact analogy he used with me was, He's a big Jaws guy. He loves Jaws, but he he pitched me on. He's like, well, what, you know, is Jaws about the shark or is Jaws about how like the community reacted to the mm, shark and yeah. the fear that this shark represented from a political standpoint, from a law enforcement standpoint, from a from a community like the community standpoint. And he's like, and you make your feature like that, like Gags is in it, and yeah, he's up to something. You know, he he's 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 evil. And, and harm exists within this world, but it's really just how how the community is reacting to it. And I was just like, oh, dude, that's great. Yeah. Let's do it. You know, let's write it. And uh, and he we wrote it in a month. Um, it, it, we, it wrote really fast. I mean, we had a few preliminary meetings where we'd go order pizza and just talk. But we, me and him, we're, we're like kind of in sync when it comes to movies. Like we have like a lot of the same tastes in movies and we look for the same things in film. So writing a movie with him was like a really great experience because it was like we, we were just on the same page from the start, you know, as far as what we wanted to do. And and yeah, and then and and when it was green lit and they got it made, I remember specifically, too, like I wrote a good chunk of our third act. And I remember even texting John. I'm like, I just we knew it was going to cu- cu- culminate into this uh, abandoned building downtown. Cause that was a big part of it was, um, you know, like, uh, the, 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 the hidden parts of the city of green Bay, like the, that, like we shot a lot of it in the industrial, um, industrial parks on the East side of green Bay. Like that was like a big part of it. Cause obviously I have a lot of experience with that. Like I, I've worked over there. Um, so that was like a big part of like my vision. So we knew we wanted to end in like this abandoned building, uh, which the city of green Bay let us shoot in, um, the old uh, canning building uh, off of Broadway that they're just turned into like, I think like luxury oh, it's a bunch of condos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we were like the last people in there when it was still just the abandoned canning factory. Um, and uh, they let us shoot in there. But anyway, I was writing the script. And I'm like, I just wrote that the characters uncover a large circus tent in the middle of this abandoned building. I'm like, it felt good writing it, but I totally understand. We probably won't get it done from a production aspect. So we'll just change it as we go. But that's like the draft everyone read and they made it work. And we 
You know, putting a circus tent right in the middle of Inside that abandoned building? building. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it turned out, it looked great. It was fantastic. Um, and one of my gifts as when we wrapped the film is they got this picture of me, which at the time, I mean, the, the three weeks that we shot it were just the craziest three weeks of my life. I was averaging like two hours of sleep a night. It was hectic. Um, but they just, I was in this tent in the middle of this abandoned canning building. Um, and I was just quick writing notes about a scene and they snapped a picture of me in that tent and then they framed it and they gave it to me on our wrap party I still have it hanging in my living room because it's just, it's just, it, God, it looks awesome. And I remember just, I look at it and I think like I wrote that and I thought there's no way they were going to make it work and they made it work. You know, it was just, it was awesome. So, yeah. You know? And I mean that, you know, that time period, even though it's a little sleep, like you're, you had to be running on so much adrenaline because oh, your man. life had like been aimed at that for so long. Like yeah. that was, that's, that's why it's amazing to me. And it's great in the same sense that you questioned making the feature. Like a lot of people in that scenario, they're like, okay, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. The opportunity is here. I'm just going to do it. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have that sense. You you wanted to also have it be creatively something you wanted. Yeah. But then once it came to life, like you had to be so pumped up for a week and a half, dude. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And it was, it was an insane, like I, we shot and two, if you see the movie, it was not an easy movie to shoot and we didn't have, I mean, we had more money that I, that I've ever seen, but it was still peanuts compared to, you know, just normal low budget shoots. You know, it was what we spent to make gigs, you know, some shoots have for their water, their bottled water budget. You know, it's just, <laughs> it, we really didn't, but we had a ton of locations. We had, uh, I, I think it was like 25 different locations. Uh, if I, I mean, I mean, I might be wrong, but it was, a, there were a lot of locations. There was a lot of talent. We had our lead talent, but we also had a ton of extras that we were constantly working with. Um, and a lot of them had like heavy makeup. Like they had to have like a lot of like clown bloody prosthetics put on their face. Um, it's really one of those stories where it's just, it's, it's just awesome how the city of green Bay, like helped us, you know, mm -hmm. and like they came and according to uh, Mayor Schmidt at the time, he said that it was, he still thinks it's the only, the only feature length film that was shot in the actual city of Green Bay limits was Gags the Clown because we shot everything pretty much downtown. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, like the the Green Bay Police Department, perfect example. We have uh, two cops who play a prominent role in the feature film. Mm -hmm. uh, Green Bay Police Department let us use one of their squad cars. Um, they drove around an actual green. I mean, they never actually drove. They were on a trailer. They were being pulled, uh, by a professional driver. Um, the actors were just pretending to drive, but it was a real green Bay, uh, police squad car. And, and, and like, and they were just so helpful and they were, and I remember one of our actors, he's, he, he's out, he's from LA, Evan Gamble. There was one time we were, there was a scene we were shooting on Adam street, downtown green Bay and that creepy alley that's right by the, um, not a creepy alley. I, I, we made it creepy. It's a really cool alley right by that old um, Schumacher building. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I can't think of it offhand. Yeah. Well, no. anyway, we were shooting there, and uh, we ultimately had to move the camera into the street, into Adam Street, to get the shot that we needed. And we had a cop there because we, we, we shot overnight um, because the entire film takes place in one night. We're shooting in May of 2017, so like our day started at... 5 p.m. and we shot until about until the sun came up so it's like two in the morning and we had a cop there who was just kind of watching everything and making sure everything was okay and we had to like move it into the street so the cop's like yeah that's no problem and he goes to his car and he gets these cones and he just blocks <laughs> off adam street and uh, granted it's like two in the morning but evan gamble who's you know he's from la he's just like like in LA that would have took three weeks of permits to do, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> but in green Bay, it was just like, whatever you got to do. And, uh, a lot of businesses and everyone were just like, so helpful. Like we shot at, um, gather on Broadway, mm -hmm. really cool scene that we shot at gather. And they were relatively new at this time. Like they were a new, like wedding venue and, uh, God, they were so awesome and letting us shoot there. And 
that was a hectic night that went way over schedule and it was nuts and we didn't get out of there when we said we'd get out of there, but they were super cool about it the whole time. And I don't know, it was just, it was really, really cool experience. And uh, again, just how the city of Green Bay kind of all came to our aid and helped us in certain ways. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So then that gets released. Uh, you put out the feature and then like, that there has to be a certain like coming back down to earth moment, right? Like, yeah. or maybe even a like, what's next? Yeah. Like, now what? Yeah. How does that play out? So once we filmed it, uh, it was, it was pretty, you know, we, we filmed it. We got it in the can by 2017. I, we had to do a couple pickups in Chicago. The first thing right off the bat was, you know, our producers let industry people watch the rough cut of it. And they're like, it's not scary enough. It's not scary enough. And I get that because it is, it's, it's a horror comedy. Like me and John, like we naturally, we infused a lot of humor into the script because a lot of it is ridiculous and funny. Like the fact that this even went viral in the first the place, it's hilarious, funny. you know? Yeah. So we, we, we wrote with that in mind. Like we made it pretty funny. Um, at least I think we made it pretty funny. Um, but that was the first thing they said, not scary enough. So then we had to go, we met in Chicago for a few pickups to just shoot scary scenes scary scenes to just splice into there. So um, me and John had to meet. We had to write these new scenes. We had to figure out how it worked, um, get the actors. So we did, I think we did three of those. That sounds like that would turn into more work. Like, like work as far as like, this isn't so much fun as what we yeah. were doing before. Well, and it was, it was cool. I'm a huge horror guy. So it was kind of fun just focusing on the horror. And I thought the three scenes that we did turned out super awesome. Um, and one, we were able to make like really funny, like scary and funny, which again was like the theme of the whole movie. So we shot those, we put those in, uh, still they're like, well, pacing this, like there was a lot of, you know, I, I didn't have, uh, and I, I didn't expect to, I mean, I'm a first time feature filmmaker, but I, I, I didn't have like final say on a lot of things. Uh, I had great, imp they allowed like a lot of input from me. But um, I, I don't think I was, I mean, if I remember correctly, I don't think I was the ultimate decision maker on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So certain things were done that I would change uh, with the feature. Um, but we had a test screening. There's a great film festival in Columbus, Ohio called the Nightmares Film Festival. They allowed us to bring the film there to do a, a test screening. So we had a, a crowd come in and they watched a very rough cut of it. And they told us what we what they liked, what they didn't like. Changes were made based off of that feedback, and then we ultimately premiered at a uh, now defunct horror genre film festival in Chicago called Cinepocalypse, which was incredible, was so awesome, and it was one of the like the night that my the gigs the clown premiered at Cinepocalypse is one of the best nights ever. Um, we had just a great turnout. I mean, it's a Midwest uh, Midwest film, so like it's a Midwest. We're premiering it at a Midwest horror festival and it was just it was really really awesome but even after that awesome screening we did a couple other screenings but we didn't get distribution um no one was like coming to us to uh i mean they they had we had inquiries but no one ultimately picked the film up um and then we sin apocalypse happened at the music music box theater in chicago which is one of the coolest movie theaters in the country and um but it's it it's they have their own so Music Box Films is their own distribution company that's like affiliated, but not really with the theater, but a lot of the same, you know, there's a lot of connections between the two. So I know the the, the folks who got us into Cinepocalypse and really liked the film pushed Music Box Films to kind of sign us. And Music Box Films has a genre sub-label called Doppelganger releasing, and that's who ultimately signed us. And then, did a very limited theatrical run with the with the feature and then ultimately released us on DVD and Blu-ray. So as far as like the coming down thing, yeah. I mean, it was one of the, and again, some of what I, my fear did come true. You know, by the time the actual feature was ready and available for a lot of people to, uh, to watch uh, who weren't following it, who didn't live in the Midwest, who just, who you couldn't just go to the festivals it was playing at. I think they just moved on. You yeah. know, they didn't care anymore. You Which know? was what I, I did like a year later. Uh, from when we went viral, yep, from the uh, viral. two and a half years. Oh dang! Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. so that's so long. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's a good premonition by your yeah. forecast. You yeah, know? and it and it, it, there is 
you know, a lot. It was one of those things where it just, it blew up like the clown sightings, but then of course it, it died down and, and then like people almost didn't even want to be reminded of it, you know? Cause mm-hmm. I think this was all during, this was all during the, the 2016 election for the 2017, you know? And that was a really tumultuous time mm. in America. And I think a lot of people like synced the two up, you know, like the sure. clown sightings was this ridiculous thing. And, 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 and it was just like this time, you know, where, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were both going for president. And it got to the point where after that in 2017 and beyond, it's like, they didn't want to be reminded of that time anymore. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, everybody was looking for they funny were, or they were done. Genre. Yeah. They yeah. were done with it. Yeah. So, um, cause I remember a lot, obviously when we went viral and then the weeks after there were a lot of people who like made ties to the election. Mm-hmm. Oh, he must be on. This candidate would be a clown supporter. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, I bet you they're on Hillary staff, you know, yeah. and they just, it, they, a lot of it was like shifted into like political propaganda. Uh, you know? Presidential so. erect- elections can uh, ruin so many things. They absolutely <laughs> can. It so absolutely can. I, I mean, I'm like, this is like my first year of like being an adult and caring where like I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a good job of like tuning it out because oh man, it drains you, oh, you know, terrible, yeah. so much negativity, so much toxicity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then, uh, what you, you probably, you, you, obviously your interest stayed, but, um, was, is there, do you take some time off from creating then? Or I, I know you love writing, so you probably yeah. kept writing, but what, what does creation look like for you between then and now? Cause I know you yeah. had some exciting stuff on the horizon. So, um, premiered in 2018, we, were officially released September. It's coming up on five years. Uh, September, don't quote me, but I think it's around September sixth, two thousand nineteen. We were we were like Blu-rays were for sale. We were on every VOT VOD outlet. Um, a month later, I became a father for the first time. So that is obviously, as you know, that's a very life altering. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I didn't, um, you know, I, I had a lot of big ideas. I, I, I still do. And I was, I was working on things, but I became a father. And then that obviously uh, all the filmmaking thing just went to the backs, you know, the back burner. Um, it was just all about trying to, you know, adjust to my new lifestyle. And, um, and then obviously, too, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very hard work. So I'm actually just now, I would say within the last year, my daughter's about to turn five it, within the last year is like time has finally opened up where I can turn back to the film stuff. And I absolutely will. I have every intention to make another project. And if that just has to be another short film that I shoot with, you know, six grand of my own money, I'll do that. You know, it's like I said, it's, it's kind of just a hobby of mine. And I've always said that. And I know a lot of friends would get like annoyed with me. Like, don't, don't, don't sell yourself short. But I say, I'm like, I'm a hobbyist filmmaker. This is something I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 41 years old. I don't expect to make a great living making movies anymore. It's literally just coming from the passion, you know, of like wanting to do it. I watch a ton of movies, a lot of movies. That's all I do is like, <laughs> I watch movies, but I'm the type of person that I can only appreciate for so long, like I, I'm really good at appreciating cinema and watching cinema, but I can only do that for so long before I have to create. I have to do something for myself, and um, I'm there again. You know, I like I have that itch again. And um, yeah, I got I got I got a few things that I'm working on that hopefully um, will get shot here in early 2025. Um, two projects, two projects that I'm I'm really excited about. One's a One's another like horror film, a ridiculous horror film, but I think people would love it. And um, one's a drama, actually, like a like a gritty, gritty character study drama slash crime thriller. Um, that's uh, that I'm really excited about. Um, it's actually a film that it's like the first film I wrote after becoming a father. So the, the there there's thematic elements in it that that mean a lot to me. Um, so yeah excited to get those off the ground, but no, that's, that's pretty much it. Like I said, after, after gigs premiered and was out there for the, for the world to consume. And there was always like, you know, that was North American. And then we got like uh Korean distribution. We got Australia and Ireland and New Zealand and UK. 
So it, there were like incremental, like exciting things. And that's the yeah. cool thing with the movie is like, it, it's out there forever now. You know, I mean, people, hopefully people in a hundred years can stumble upon gigs, the clown and see something you did. Like that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and two, like just, we were in North America and then four months later we were in Australia and, and, and Korea. And it, it's cool too. Cause you know, if you follow, which I do, I'm not going to try and act like I'm above following, like, st- to this day, like, I'll read, like, I'll go on Letterboxd, oh. and I'll read reviews yeah, on the fun. movie. Yep. Yeah, but you can all- always tell when it hits a new territory, because you got all these people from this one country commenting on it. Um, yeah. It's it's pretty cool, uh, but, yeah, I've, I've been, for the most part, I, I, I've been very pleased with, like, wow, the reviews people have given it. Like, it's it's a very in-the-middle film. Like you either really like it or you really didn't like it, and I understand that. I really do. Um, it, it, we went into it not making it a movie for everyone. Um, we knew a large portion of the horror community wanted it to be gigs running around and cutting people up with chainsaws. Right. But that's we didn't want to do that. And yeah. I, I'm I'm very proud of what we did, but I also knew it was going to be kind of a polarizing film, you know. Mm-hmm. And and too, it is it is. There is an element. It, it is kind of political um, because of what we were dealing with in the aftermath of it going viral and the death threats that we were receiving. A lot of that was tied into, you know, conservative America. And a lot of that showed up in the film, you know, but that rubbed people the wrong way. And I understand that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, what a, what a trip. It's yeah. just a, a wild ride. Yeah, man. it was it was fun. And, and to this day, too, it's. At work, it happens a lot, or like in my network, my professional network, someone will just Google me based on like what I do for a living, like my day job, and they'll be like, yeah. "You <laughs> made a you? horror movie." <laughs> <laughs> it comes up probably like once a month of someone's just like stumbling, like, "Wait a minute, you caused that clown craze in 2016?" I'm like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be interesting to know if there were spikes like with popular like clown stuff. Like, did you watch the 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 um season of American Horror Story with the clown? Like, oh that, yeah, that was yeah. a terrifying clown. Yes, and it'd yeah. be interesting to know if like if that clown drove traffic to your clown. Well, you know, absolutely. And so there were lots of things. So um, I remember uh the the year I walked into uh Spirit of Halloween. And they had a full-size animatronic clown. You, no one will convince me they didn't rip off gigs. Right, they had yeah. the exang- same exact costume, same exact facial features. And you made the mask. They, and I made the mask. <laughs> and like I remember posting it on Facebook and like asking my friend, I'm like, what do you guys think? Did you know the the, the Spirit of Halloween rip me off? And they were like, oh my God, yes. Like they are, ab- and you, if you look at it, if you look at it side by side of what they came up with and a picture of Gags the Clown in full costume, it's, it's obvious that they, that they used it. And I didn't, I didn't pursue, I did like, I legally could have done something, but I didn't. It was yeah. one of those things where it was, I was flattered, you know? And I know there was a lot of, there was a t shirt company down in Milwaukee who like stole, made like t shirts. Uh, and it, it like legit t-shirts, not even like out of the trunk of his car. Like they, they had like a storefront in downtown Milwaukee and they were selling gigs apparel. And I had friends like, Oh, you got, you should sue them. You, you own the copyright for that. And I was just like, ah, it's just kind of cool. You know, that like I created something that so many people and like, yeah, I've never been that type of person. Maybe that's one of my, my downfalls in life. I've never been that type of person who, immediately just thinks of everything as financial prosperity. Mm -hmm. It's more or less like I was really like kind of flattered that, that something I did caught so many people's attention to the point where like they were selling bootleg t-shirts. Yeah, for sure. It's just kind of cool. You know, I think that's one of the, that's one of the traits. One of my favorite music artists is Jason Isbell. And uh, he has a, there's an interview where they talk to him about, there's an artist, uh, like a, a much more mainstream country artist that covered one of his best songs. And they, I'm pretty sure they think significantly different politically. Sure. And uh, like the interview was trying to draw something out of him about that. And his answer was almost the same as yours. He was like, you know, something that I made moved somebody to want to recreate that same thing regardless of who it is, there's an appreciation in that, you yeah. know, like the, I created something that somebody else wants to 
you know, create as well. That's mm-hmm. it's powerful, man. It absolutely is. Yeah. There and there's been projects like the circle, like my producers and me and John. There's there's been projects that have come out that we'll just email or text back and forth and we'll be like it's somehow it's connected to gigs. Like it was someone at Cinepocalypse who then and went full went to work for a movie company, but then they made uh another movie that took pretty much all of like major thematic elements from gigs and they kind of reworked them and they like, and we were just talking and, and of course their films went on to be more successful than the gigs, the clown was. So of course this might just all be us like sitting around being petty, but we're like, (laughs) what do you think? Like, do you think that we kind of inspired them to do this? And it was just a resounding like, Oh yeah. Like they got that idea from watching gigs. Like they, made a twist here and a twist there, but they absolutely, they, they, and they, but at the same time, just what you said, like, I'm like, I'll think about it and be like, yeah, that's what I thought too. And then I'll be like, well, that's kind of cool. You know, like if I can say anything, at least like I, I inspired other art to be made, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't understand. We've talked a little bit about the, like the future projects, but I don't understand all the terminology. Like what does the option thing mean? Like you get to create something now that m- could get picked up. Right. So I, I signed, uh, so it's a script that I wrote. Um, it was, uh, it was, I signed a shopping agreement. So a producer out in LA, um, that we signed an agreement where now he has the exclusive rights to shop this film to get it produced. Um, and, uh, and he's specifically, you know, my lead act, the, the lead actor in this project is he kind of, he had some roles in the last year where like, things kind of blew up for him a little bit. Well, in Hollywood, that means you can get more meetings with big time producers. So I was trying to sell it myself. I've made a few connections, nothing substantial, but I was trying to sell it myself. But he was just like, look, if you sign it to me, you know, I can, I can, uh, I, I have more connections than you do, you know, and me and we both want to see this film get made. So, so that's what I did. I signed it. So for two years, I can't touch the project. It's now own. It's now, it's uh, only this uh, producer out in LA. Like he can, he can sell it. So that's what that means. And um, if it sells, can you work on it then again? Or yeah, no matter okay. what. I mean, I, I, I'm the, I'm the writer. I didn't, I didn't uh, forego any of my ownership to the project. Um, but that's what he said. He's like, look, I mean, and and, I, and that's, I like his, his reality, like he, he throws some reality at me. He's like, look, odds are, you know, if we sell this to, I'm just throwing this out there. If we sell this to a two four, they're not going to want you to direct it. Cause you're, you're, you're not a, you're not mm-hmm. a filmmaker in their eyes. So he's like, you need to shoot a, a POC is what I said. It's a proof of concept. So that's essentially like a, a, a three or four page excerpt from the, the script that you shoot, but it's like your resume. And it's mm, like, I and see. it's to show, uh, a producer that you know what you're doing. Now I I shot a feature from gigs was a feature film and I, I have that on my resume, but you know, a project like this, which is wildly different than gigs, that what doesn't mean anything, you mm-hmm. know? And, and two, it's Hollywood, like a lot of industries, it's what have you done for me lately? Oh, know? for sure. Yeah. So it's, that's already almost like it's not even on my resume. Um, so, uh, so yeah, he's like, we would push for you to direct the project, but you need to, you know, you need to shoot this proof of concept. You need this in your back pocket. So it's like, well, does he know what he's doing? And be like, well, yes, this is, he does know what he's doing. You know? Gotcha. Yep. And it's, a, and it's pretty common. Like, so I'm, I'm working on two proof of concepts. The other one too is it, something where uh, you can use, if you want to go the route of uh, crowdfunding, you know, which a lot of, you know, indie filmmakers choose to do. Uh, just having that two or three minute proof of concept like that, that that's a make or break thing for your, your campaign. Something super eye catching. Exactly. Yeah. Super eye catching has the, the ability to go viral, you know, obviously. And, and it, you just bait the horror uh, websites and to just pick up with it. And hopefully it creates steam and enough steam where you, you know, you get a, a lot of donations to your campaign. Um, but yeah, so like a proof of concept would be huge for something like that. Um, mm-hmm. Like I can sit here and talk into a camera about what I'm going to do, or I can show you what I can do with very limited resources. Now imagine if I had a hundred thousand dollars, you mm-hmm. know, something like that. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. That's exciting, man. It's so yeah. exciting. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's such a, it's such a, a lottery ticket 
industry, you know, like it really feels like you gotta be super lucky <laughs> to, to like make it, um, super lucky or super, super talented. So, um, but, uh, yeah, it, and that's just the thing. Like we talked about earlier, I'm not gonna, uh, if I'm just making movies that only like my wife and daughter watch, like I'm going to be making something, but obviously you want to try and try and get as many people to see it as possible. Right. So, yeah. yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, one last thing. I know you're a big Bucks fan. What's oh, the, yeah. what's the Bucks forecast like in your eyes? I think it's good. I think it's good. I mean, I think they did a lot. Uh, this they did a lot with a little this off season. You know, I, I I'm a fan of the three free agents they picked up. Um, I think having an actual full year with Doc as the head coach is going to benefit them. Um, I think Damian Lillard's he's kind of fallen into that I got a lot to prove category now. I hope you know? so. Yeah, and I think he's going to come out with a vengeance. I really do. Um. And Giannis too. It's just it's just weird how like the the public opinion of the Bucks has kind of fallen off so much, you know. Or it's Giannis has been hurt now the last two playoffs, and I don't think anyone gives him a chance. And I think that's going to be fuel to their fire. I really do. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I don't know. He's, I don't know. I don't know why the narrative around Giannis specifically has changed so much. I don't know either. It, like, is it the injury thing? I, I don't know, because he's still an absolute animal. Yeah. And it it lasted, what, maybe, what, two years, I would say, max two years, that every, there were people, a lot of people that were saying Giannis is the best player on the planet. Like, And now, like, all of a sudden, just nobody says that anymore. I it's think weird. A, I think a lot of it has to do with his... So there's little, like, free throw shooting is a big thing. Yeah. That playoff game where... He was playing hot potato with the ball. He tried to get the ball to Middleton as fast as he could because yeah. he didn't want it in his hands because he didn't trust his free throw making. Yeah, They're going to look at that and be like, that's not an NBA superstar. You know, no NBA superstar should be doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's just like those little things. And too, kind of like one of the themes of the whole podcast here is like they won the championship in 2021. They got hot. They got hot. Now they're cooling off. You know? Yeah. And, other teams, you know, Sixers are getting better, and the I don't the Celtics. I don't even know where they're getting their uh, their money. Like, I, it's yeah, just insane. Like what they're doing in the off season, but yeah, they're just. I think they've just cooled off a little, and now they got to do it all over again. What have you done for me lately? You know, they got to show them again. Like they can be good. You know, yeah. Celtics are in a weird spot where they're just they're just spending everything. They 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 have to be so far into the luxury tax. I have no idea and what the numbers are. But where it's is be it coming from? You know, like I, I get they just won a championship. I get it's one of the coveted franchises in the league. But yeah, I just don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah, I hope so, man. I don't know. I remember I remember texting my friends when the the Damian Lillard trade happened. And I was like, it's cool, whatever. I wasn't a huge fan of it at the beginning. And they were both telling me how crazy I was. Like, you got to make that trade. And I was like, agree. Optic wise, you do probably have to make that trade. But team wise, like, do you have to make that trade? I'm not the one getting paid to make the decisions, but do you? Yeah. Like Drew goes to Boston, wins a championship. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that's still a little Mm -hmm. hurtful, man. I was just (laughs) looking at the text. It was end of, it was like third week of September last year. I was just looking at the text where my buddy sent me the, the, the headline, like Damien traded to the, uh, to the bucks. And my first, my comment was that's awesome. Sucks that drew had to go. Though. Yeah. You know, like, cause that was the first thought I had too, is I'm like on paper. Yeah. You make that trade, but from a team like cohesion of the team, I don't know. You know? So. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. Adam. Yeah, I appreciate man. you coming to chat. It was cool hearing the story and, yeah. uh, Uh, Best of luck with whatever you choose to do. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate that. Best of luck to you, too.